welcome to the fifth and penultimate episode of Essential Finance, a video content series in partnership with BDH Sterling focused on providing financial tips for the Australian business and expat community in the UK. I'm Jessica Sullivan, the member and project manager at the Australia UK Chamber of Commerce. The fifth edition in our six part video series will provide an overview on property bricks, mortar and money. Delighted to be chatting with you again, Stephen. Welcome and thank you. Um, the last time we spoke, we delved into the role financial planning played in growing your wealth, but our focus now slides to property, home ownership and investment. With approximately 120,000 Aussies making the UK their home, either indefinitely or for their working career, living arrangements are a top priority. Many Aussies may be wondering whether it's worth buying or renting in the UK market, and if they have either property back home or property in the UK, whether they sell, hold or rent. Well, I think it depends on which direction. Um, I, I do think this is another area whilst property where Aussies, we all sort of love a property investment and it's something that's ingrained in us. Uh, but it's it's probably arguably the most complex area. Um, and it's complex because it's easy to make mistakes as usual and because you're really obliged to work in two systems. Um, so once you're in the UK, you have to uh, fundamentally put it in a tax return in both countries, but they're the, the taxes are calculated very differently. Uh, so you have to contrast those. One big mistake that I think, um, A, again, back to my own circumstances and how things have changed is, you know, in Australia, we had negative gearing, which means you can offset some of the losses in your personal income tax and reduce it. Once you leave the country, that goes away. The other big, big change that's happened is that if you have a home in, the U, in Australia and you don't sell it before you leave, you lose your primary residence benefit uh, and so you end up um, basically turning that asset into something that's now subject to capital gains tax in both countries if you are here i guess it does depend on your um, stage of life and what your intent is if you're if you're not here for very long it's, it's a difficult case to justify buying something unless it's a fixer upper perhaps because eventually you're going to pay stamp duty you're going to have selling costs you take the risk that that money is not going to grow whatsoever versus other alternatives and it's not very liquid uh, so I think you need to decide that if you've got one in Australia, um, it's a very difficult situation to try to decide what to do because you are now working in two tax regimes. So just to contrast it in Australia, uh, interest on your mortgage is 100% deductible. In Britain, only 20% is. So you're more likely to have to pay taxation on that. You're going to have to submit a tax return in Australia. Uh, so you're going to have to pay the fees to get that done under one set of rules. And then you're going to have to get another one done in Britain where the rules are different. Uh, and so that's just automatically uh, pumping up the cost. I think one of the difficulties is if you are in living in Britain, you're obligated um, to acknowledge your worldwide income, but you get two methods of calculating. One is we're used to, which just means as it arises, you just put it in your income statement and pay tax. The other one's called remittance. Uh, and that means that that you fundamentally have to, um, to to use that method can work in your favor, but you lose your personal allowance and use your capital gains allowance. Uh, if you have a property and you're in the 40 percent tax bracket, it's just going to mean that that's going to get added onto your income statement and less likely you're going to pay quite hefty tax on on the property. You can claim credits between the two countries, but um, you need to know what you're doing in those circumstances. Uh, the last point is, I guess, selling it then. So if you are renting it out uh, and you've left it in Australia, it will be subject to capital gains. If it was your home, for example, now there's a likelihood, A, you've lost all as a capital gain, but as you continue, uh, there's two sets of calculations. And the tax in um, the UK on capital gains is, is fixed amount, but it's, it's higher than other assets, as an example. So it's 28% or 18%. So they add another 8% on. So you need to understand, I guess, the pros and cons, not only of the property and as that is an investment, but how that might compare to other alternative investments. Um, that depends on your time frame. It's not particularly straightforward at all. That's why we need this really robust advice. Uh, key to such a such decision, Stephen, what would be what what should I be aware of if I do decide to rent my Australian property when I move to the UK? We talked about some of those nuances, but it'd be great to delve into that. Are there any unexpected expenses I should look out for regarding the Australia UK property market in that respect? Well, I think that's where they're quite different. I think if I just try to summarise the broad buckets, uh, a you're going to have to do two tax returns, so you can't really avoid that. That that impacts you know the method as i said impacts your uh, british return as well so that can start to cause more tax here and you lose some of the advantages 
that just depends on how much you pay. Sometimes you have to forfeit them anyway, so it's not a great deal of loss. But so the inadvertent consequence is it, it double whammies you really um, because you you lose some benefits along with having to pay British tax. Uh, the other thing that people often are aware of is sometimes the banks insist that if you are uh, renting, you have to go onto a buy to let mortgage. Uh, often they charge a higher interest rate. So when you are leaving, particularly as a foreigner, they get even more nervous because now you're not here. Uh, so you have to expect possibly that you will uh, have a higher interest rate now. Uh, the other one is insurances. So uh, that varies by country, uh, but in Britain, sometimes they expect other insurances like land sort insurance to be part of, of what you pay. I think the other ones are just things that come with common property ownership. So if you're in a foreign country, who's looking after the place in terms of maintenance, you've got someone you trust. Sometimes properties can degenerate. There's the whole vacancy period, you know, if you, if you don't have tenants in there. So there's usual costs of that. Uh, and in Britain, it's actually quite hard to sometimes get tenants out if they don't want to. So uh, there's those contrasts, whereas Australia, it seems a little bit um, bit, bit simpler if, if the you know, tenants aren't playing ball. So I guess all those indirect issues, you really have to weigh up along with just the standard calculations of is buy to let properties uh, a good investment full stop. Still much confidence um, here, Stephen, in that respect, just particularly as we, we look to make these big decisions. Um, and you really help us understand the value of bricks and mortar for those of us living between the two countries. To summarise, do you feel property is a good wealth asset overall? Well, I think uh, I think it really depends. I think I will say that everyone's circumstances are different uh, and no real investment choices can be made in isolation of the other ones. So I think it's a bit of a package deal. It's a bit like you move one bit, you really have to see how that affects the other bits. What I will say is, is that property can be, and we know that, particularly as Aussies, and I know if you've been keeping tabs on the Aussie property market, it's gone fantastic in the last couple of years, like 15, 20% growth in some areas. Um, so it really does depend on, a lot on, did you pick a good property? Was it in a good area? Is the population growing there? I guess the second one is, did you renovate it? Because quite often, if it is your home, you buy it, you fix it up and renovate it and then sell it as your primary residence, uh, that can be a good one. Most investments, you can't borrow money to invest, but property is one way you can. So it's not using all your money. So in the return on investment can generally be uh, much higher. And it's a savings plan, isn't it? If you've got a, a, a capital and interest mortgage, then fundamentally you're buying more of that property as you go along as you pay the mortgage. So you're basically saving, except someone else is now paying for it. Yeah. Uh, so from that point of view, it's a great, uh, it's a great asset. The drawbacks are that it's taxable. And there's not a lot of flexibility on that, unlike, say, an ISA here where there's no taxation. So your growth is shielded from all that and you don't have to put in tax returns and all the complexity. Um, it is one asset in one place. Uh, so that's a, a bit of a gamble in that you picked a good property. You know, London used to be traditionally a bit of a faithful you know, place to buy property, but that's now a bit more questionable. Should I buy here? Should I buy there? You're, you're taking a punt. One house, one suburb. All the maintenance issues we've talked about, I guess there's the opportunity cost. So what could you have done with the money yeah. that would have done better? Yeah. That's an inevitable question you should always weigh up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the last couple of points is it's very hard to know the value of something. So when you get when you get nearer the end of uh, your working life, if you like, and you're heading into retirement, now you've got this question mark over, well, how much money do I really have? Because I don't know the value of the house. If I sold it, I don't know what value I have. But even more difficult is unlike other investments, you've got capital growth on that property, but you can't access it. You can only get the rent. Uh, so the return on it, you're only accessing half. Whereas if I was in an ISA, for example, I can get the capital growth from that fund growth and I can get any distributions of income. So I can access the whole lot. Uh, so it's, a, it's much more flexible at, at that stage in life. So uh, there's pros and cons, I think, and people have their own preferences and their own comfort. So we just have to respect that you, know, you need to weigh that up for everybody. Fabulous. Thank you again, Stephen. It's been quite enlightening for me personally, and you've made me feel very reassured regarding getting my house in order, no pun intended there, um, and how I can best manage uh, property acquisitions and investments between Australia and the UK. Again, can you remind our network of the best way to get in touch with you and your colleagues at BDH Sterling to discuss this further? I think the simplest way is if you just jump on our website, which is www.bdhsterling.com, you'll find loads of information there, but also you will find the contact details. So send us an email and, and we'll have someone call you for a chat. The final edition in the Essential Finance video series will be released as June comes to a close. We'll be welcoming BDH Sterling's Simon Harvey from episode one back to chat with Chamber CEO, Catherine Wu, to round out the series and focus on 
your, the, your essential finance checklist. Thank you. <music>